Good morning. Hate to interrupt the chat, the chatter, but it is time for us to begin with our morning worship service. Uh, before we actually start our service, just a couple of announcements to be made. First of all, for our visitors, we're delighted to have you. You are indeed our honored guest. And we ask if you would please stick around a few minutes after services so we can become better acquainted and get to know you. Also, if you have need of a nursery, we have two nurseries. We have an attended nursery out the door to my left. <laughs> and down the hallway, there's an attended nursery there. If you, there's an, also an unattended nursery, go out the doors in the back up the stairs to the left. There's an unattended nursery there as well. As you know, because of the pandemic, we've been using these little communion cups. If you did not pick up one when you came in the building, if you would, raise your hand and Charlie will be glad to bring one to you now at this time. Not to insult anybody's intelligence, but if you look at them on the very top, there's a real thin film that's got some purple markings on it. You peel that back to get to the, to the wafer, and then there's a little tab that you break off and peel back to get to the fruit of the vine. If you would please bow with me now, we'll begin our services with prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, we come before thee now so thankful that we can assemble here and worship thee in spirit and in truth as outlined in your word. We just pray, Father, that you continue to be with us, that we live in a nation that's, that gives us that freedom. We ask that you be with those that are in, in the leadership positions in our nation today, Father, and they realize that indeed you are the true authority in all things, and they should temper our laws and the way that we live our lives in accordance to thy word. Father, we know that as we live our everyday lives, we come in contact with those that do not have the same views that we do. We just pray, Father, that when the opportunity presents itself, that we will indeed share what we believe your word says to them, Father, for we know indeed that your word is the truth, and it is the guiding light in our lives today. Father, there are many on our prayer list. You know what their needs are. We just pray that you be with them and their families and comfort them as only that you can. Continue to guide us in all that we do, Father. We pray that we let your word guide us day and night in all that we do. We ask, Father, when we do sin and we stumble, we fall short of thy glory, that we realize all we have to do is come before thee with a penitent heart and repent of those sins that they'll be forgiven. Continue to guide us now, Father, as we go out through the rest of this worship service, that we remove those thoughts of the world from our minds and we center our thoughts and our minds on what's being presented to us today. Continue to guide us now, Father, and we ask that in all things thy will be done. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good gravy, there's a lot of you out there. It's good to see all of you this morning. We're going to sing three verses of God of Our Fathers. This is not one that we sing a whole often, a lot, and there's some oddball chord progression through there somewhere in the middle. I hope you can keep up. I'd like you to teach you all those parts, but I don't know all of them, so I apologize for that. God. charge to keep I have. 
We'll sing all three verses of this and we'll have another prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and for all the blessings we enjoy. We praise and glorify your name for all that you give to us and all that we do, that, that we have. Help us to seek your will in all that we do. We thank you for the country in which we live. May we never take it for granted. May we never take for granted the blessings we enjoy in this country. Help us to be respectful and responsible citizens. We pray for peace. We pray for all who need our prayers and who have asked for our prayers. Oh God, we pray for all who are, are under medical treatment. We pray the treatment will bring them to great, better health. We pray for our young people who serve our country. We pray, our Father, that you will keep them from harm's way. Oh God, we pray that you will help us to open our hearts and to glorify your name in what we do today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After we sing this song, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. By Christ redeemed in Christ restored, we need the supper.
As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, I'll be reading from John chapter 6, verses 48 through 56. Jesus is speaking here to the Pharisees, the Jew, Jewish rulers, as the scripture says. This is a part of his ministry now where he's uh, in Capernaum uh, in the northern country, Galilee, if you will, to stay out of Jerusalem because by now the Jewish leaders are plotting to kill him. And as you know, he was not the Messiah the Jewish leaders expected at all. Uh, he performed great miracles, but he, he uh, um, also did not meet the, 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 the criteria they thought this, the Messiah would have. And in particular, in the previous chapter, he had violated, according to them, of the, uh, uh, the Sabbath by performing miracles on those days. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes from down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life and I will raise them up in the last day. And further, Jesus says in verse 56, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. These would be a, a familiar imagery uh, and familiar to the Jewish leaders, this thought of bread, because they had been fed uh, for so many years in the desert by the manna. And blood was a pivotal part of the judicial system, uh, sorry, the Jewish system, of sacrifice. And with that, Jesus later establishes the Lord's Supper on the night he was betrayed and equates that bread with his, with his body and the blood and the fruit of the vine with his blood, which redeems us. And with that in mind, would you all pray with me, please? Father, we thank you, Lord, for that son you sent to us, the Messiah, the Savior, Father, the takes away the sin of the world and takes away our sin. We thank you, Father, for being the bread represented here now, his body, which was broken for us. As we taste of this bread, Father, may we consider this great thing that Christ has done for us. And may we keep in mind at all times, Father, that with this, it proves that he lives in us and we live in him. And that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's now pray for the fruit of the vine. And Lord, you have also given us this symbol of life, life itself, you call it in the Old Testament, the life that comes through the blood. The blood was such an important part of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, but we know that Christ, through his blood, was the ultimate sacrifice, a sacrifice given for us when we were yet still sinners. We thank you, Lord, for this. May we not only at this moment as we taste this fruit of the vine, but throughout the week, consider what Jesus has done for us and live in accordance with his commands, with his example, Father, to please him, Father. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. We do have a prayer at this time for the offering. Uh, the term is, changed, uh, is used in the uh, Bible as an offering, a collection. Sometimes you'll hear folks up in the front of the um, auditorium refer to it as gi giving back. But uh, in any case, we do have an obligation to present our offerings each week to the Lord. The offerings that are provided to this congregation are used in the furtherance of the word. And with that in mind, would you all pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for the many blessings you give us. We've just concluded the Lord's Supper where we reminisce, Father, and remember and proclaim the, the death of your son and what he has done for us. May we, Father, not forget our obligation to, to serve as Christians to you, Father, and that obligation takes place in terms of faith and works and worship and deeds 
but Father, also in our giving and our generosity. And may we never forget these lessons that you provided to us, Lord. We thank you, Father, again for your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Before we get into the scripture and the lesson, we'll sing, Where He Leads, I'll Follow. Let's stand for this song and the scripture reading, please, if you can. Sweet are the promises, God is the word, dear God, any message man ever heard. Your laws are mine, the Christ, endless I see. He a great example is a pattern for me. Where are these all found? Our scripture reading today will be from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may claim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You may be seated. Again, we say welcome to all of you who are visiting with us this morning. Looks like we have quite a few here, uh, and we're glad that you chose to be with us this morning on this July the 4th weekend. Uh, stick around for a few minutes. Let us find out what brought you our way and get to know you just a little bit better and bid you Godspeed as you go on wherever you're going. And if you're visiting from the community, uh, Church shopping, as we sometimes call it, looking for a place to worship, uh, we would love to have the opportunity to tell you why you found that place, and we would love to have you a part of that uh, this morning. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to meet Braxton, this is what, second time here? Uh, Braxton's with us again this morning, so if you haven't got a chance to meet Jessica and Spencer's new baby, uh, now would be a good time to do that and uh, see how cute he is and, and welcome him to the family. But again, we're glad that you're all here today. We celebrate 245th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. It was signed on July 4th, 1776 in Philadelphia. And the document ushered in, in Kevin's humble opinion, the greatest nation that has ever existed on the face of the planet. And we are privileged and blessed to be able to live in that nation today, regardless of whatever flaws we might see and whatever difficulties we might be experiencing and, and whatever your political views are that might not jive with everyone else, it's still the best place to be. And mainly and first and foremost because you and I get to sit here and worship this morning without fear of being molested in any way because of the rights and privileges we have in this country. It would also usher the country in the signing of that Declaration of Independence into a seven years long war, which would end on September the 3rd, 1783. And so while I'm sure the day was a bright, joyous day when they signed that Declaration of Independence, it would be seven years before they would begin to reap the benefits and realize that because of what they had to do to get there. You know, at 245 years, our nation's one of the babies on the planet, one of the youngest uh, on the planet. The youngest actually is South Sudan. They became a nation in 2011, uh, 
Palau, if I'm pronouncing that right, East Timor, Montenegro, Serbia, Kosovo, all just within recent history, all became nations. And so we're not the youngest, but we're certainly not the oldest nation, not anywhere near. Here's the 10 oldest nations on the face of the planet. Ethiopia is considered to be the oldest all the way through France, which has been around a long, 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 long time. But 245 years is a long time. Even England, uh, said to be established or began as a country, recognized as a country somewhere 901 to 1000 AD, uh, means it's about 1120 years old if you take that youngest date there of 901. Even the country we fought against in the Revolutionary War was ancient compared to what our, our country is today. And so that Declaration of Independence is what we celebrate today, but that wasn't the only declaration uh, that was signed. That was also what was called the Declaration of Dependence. It was signed on November the 28th, 1776. And it was signed by 547 loyalists from New York and the surrounding, area, surrounding areas, merchants, yeomen, freemen, or freed slaves, Basically, a mix of representatives of people who wanted to remain loyal to the crown, who didn't want America to declare its independence. They signed this document, and it took place at Francais Tavern, located at 54 Pearl Street in Lower Manhattan. That's the picture you see in the lower right-hand corner. It's also commonly referred to as the Queen Heads Tavern. But they signed their wishes that the United States, or that what were the colonies, would remain loyal to England during that particular time. Two different declarations, two different intents. We know and celebrate the Declaration of Independence, well, because that side won the, the conflict that went along with that. The other declaration is still a part of our country's history, but lesser known because it was opposite of what most people wanted at that particular time. And so this morning, I want us to think about this concept of the Declaration of Independence and a declaration of dependence. Because I think these have spiritual applications to what we do and who we are in our Christian lives. The idea of independence and the idea of dependence are part of our, our makeup as Christians. And so number one, let's talk about the idea of when we come to Christ, when we come to Christ, we declare our independence. And the logical question that we might ask is, well, what do we declare our independence from when we come to Christ? And the simple answer for that that covers, I think, everything we can say about that is we declare our independence from sin. John chapter 8 and verse 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that's free in the spiritual sense has nothing to do with a nationalistic sense or a political sense. We are free in the sense of our spiritual relationship with God. Free from sin. D.A. Carlson Carson wrote, If God had perceived our greatest need was economic, He would have sent us an economist. If He had perceived that our greatest need was entertainment, He would have sent us a comedian or an artist. If God had perceived that our greatest need was political stability, He would have sent us a politician. Thankfully, He didn't. If he had perceived that our greatest need was health, he would have sent us a doctor. But he perceived that our greatest need involved our sin, our alienation from him, our profound rebellion, our death, and he sent us a Savior. And that's what we celebrate this morning coming together as members of the Lord's body, as we partook of the Lord's Supper just a few minutes ago. We celebrate our Savior. What is sin? Well, one definition is sin is anything that's contrary to the will of God. It's a distortion of the word God made from, or the distortion of the world God made from perfection that God intended. It can be stubbornness, rebellion, outright disobedience. Sin is a cause of all pain, hurt, and confusion and doubt in the world. And sin is at work inside of us. Sin distorts our heart, obstructs our view of God, and this distances us from God, putting a barrier between us. When we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can with confidence and without a doubt say, we are free from sin. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's what scripture promises. 
That's what Jesus promised. That's what the inspired writers promised. We are, as Christians, free from sin. Let me give you the case for that idea. John 8, verse 34. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. <clears throat> and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Another argument for it. Romans 4 and verse 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Romans 6 and verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Romans 6 and verse 7. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Romans 6 and verse 11. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Over and over and over again, Scripture tells us as Christians we are freed from sin. But that's not the whole list. Let me read on. Romans 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Romans 6 and verse 18. Having been set free from sin. Romans 6, 22. But now having been set free from sin. Romans 8 and verse 2. For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus, who has made us free from the law of sin and death. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. And you He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians 2 and verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us together, alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. Colossians 1 and verse 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which I am the foremost. 1 John 2 and verse 12. Your sins are forgiven you for His name's sake. Why belabor all of those points? Why read all of those scriptures? Because I'm guessing there's somebody out there saying, yeah, I understand that, but you don't know what I've done. And the answer to that question is, or that response, no, I don't know what you've done. Number two, I don't care what you've done, but God knows what you've done. And he's promised that when you're immersed in the waters of baptism, your sins are forgiven. And you can, without doubt, a doubt claim your independence from sin, if you are part of the, of the family of God. We are free from our past life. Yes, we may face the consequences of our past life, but there's nothing from that past life that can be held against me when it comes to whether or not I'm going to heaven. Those sins do not exist as far as God is concerned. When the signers of the Declaration of Independence put quill to paper, they declared their independence and the next seven years was what? Roses and puppy dogs? No, the next seven years was a war that claimed thousands upon thousands of lives. Property lost. It was a terrible time in our country for people who had to go through that. After that was years of rebuilding from the war. After that was figuring out how to make this experiment in democracy work. And so it wasn't just the easiest thing in the world to sign the Declaration of Independence and say, woohoo, look what we've done. And the same is true for us. We can be free from sin. But you know what? The old temptations, the old habits, the old way of thinking, they don't, don't just go away. In other words, just as our country had to fight a war when you come to Christ, you may have to fight a war to stay where you need to be in, in, in Christ. Because that sin, Satan would love to pull you back into that world and make you a part of it once again. Our sins are forgiven. Let's stress that again. Our sins are forgiven. But as we struggle to walk in the light as He is in the light, that's something that's daily in our thought and in our focus. But we don't have to carry the guilt with us of what we've done before. That's taken care of. When we obey the gospel of Christ, we can with all confidence claim that we are free from sin. That is our declaration of independence. When we come to Christ, well, I should guess I'll read that. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. 
and rejoice in the hope and glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance is character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out on our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who, has, who was given to us, Romans chapter 5, the first five verses. When we come to Christ, we declare our dependence. Those 547 people who signed that declaration of dependence were declaring that they were loyal to King George III. They were loyal to the country of England. So we declare our independence from sin. What do we declare our dependence, our dependence to? That should say dependence there instead of that. We declare our dependence to Jesus. We are dependent upon Him for the rest of our lives. Jesus would liken the idea of grapevines. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. We're dependent upon the vine in order for us as branches to survive. Jesus also told us, he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That's Matthew 10, verses 38 and 39. He also said you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto, unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 37. Jesus told us to seek first the kingdom of God. Romans 6 and verse 18 says we are slaves of righteousness. Romans 6 and verse 22, we are slaves of God. Romans 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In Paul, when he was praising the generosity of the Macedonian brethren, he said of them in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 5, that they first gave themselves to the Lord. We declare our dependence. Once we become children of God, we are dependent upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We cannot be separate, separated from Him. We cannot act without Him. We cannot do things that don't fit within His plan. And that's where our dependence comes from in our lives. Interesting Old Testament parallel to this. In ancient Israel, you could own slaves. You could keep that slave for six years, but in the seventh year, according to the law, you had to let that slave Go. That's Exodus 21 and verse 2 and Deuteronomy 15 and verse 12. But God made a provision. He said, if when being released the servant wants to stay, here's the procedure. But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl and he shall serve him forever. That's Exodus 21, verses 5 and 6. In a sense, when we're baptized into Christ, we are in effect saying, I love my master, I will not go out. And that baptism is the all driven through our ear into the doorpost in the presence of witnesses to proclaim we are Jesus's forever. It's our declaration of dependence. Galatians 2 and verse 20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We're independent from sin and independent from the spiritual death that's the result of sin. We're dependent upon our Lord and his grace and his family and his kingdom. These are our declarations of independence. These are our declaration of dependence. You know, those historical documents that we mentioned were signed by those who, who chose to do so. So far as we know, not a single person had a sword held to his throat and said, you sign this declaration of independence or else. They signed it of their own free will. And you know what? No one today is forced or should be forced to make a declaration of Jesus Christ. Many times in history, conversions have been made at the point of a sword, the point of a gun. You do this or die. It's not the way it was ever intended to be. No one should be forced 
or coerced to make that decision. It should be because it's the thing I want to do. It's the thing you want to do. It's the thing you need to do in order to fulfill your so-called destiny in relation to Jesus Christ. You know, the Roman emperors trying to stop Christianity would sometime give them a chance to renounce their faith and pay their obligation to the Roman deities. And if they would do so, Emperor Decius was especially uh, fond of this, he would issue what's called a libellus. And it was just a statement that's saying, Tom Jones did hereby fulfill his duty toward whatever pagan god it was and renounce his Christianians. And he could carry that around and get along just fine. But he had to renounce his faith. You know, we mentioned the Macedonians a few minutes ago. Paul said they were freely willing. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 3. Freely willing. God wants us if we want to be here. God wants us if we don't want to be here, but he's not going to force us to be a part of his family. That's our choice. That's our privilege, if you will, in life. Paul says, take the whole armor of God. That means Kevin's got to accept it. Take the helmet of salvation. That means I've got to willingly do that. It's offered, it's available, but the decision is always yours as to whether or not you accept that offer. You know, Jesus made an offer to the rich young ruler, Matthew chapter 19. And the rich young ruler couldn't accept that offer. He walked away from Jesus. Don't know if he was ever once again confronted with that, if he ever came to Christ. Scripture doesn't tell us. But you notice one thing, Jesus didn't try to stop him. Didn't go after him. In John 6 and verse 66, many disciples quit following Jesus because of the, the tough things he was saying. He didn't chase them down and try to convince them. In Matthew 10, Jesus sent out the 12 for the lack of a better term for a preaching mission. And he told them the cities that didn't receive them, shake the dust off your feet and go on elsewhere. Why? Because Jesus wants people to come to him fully and freely. We must come to, on his terms, but we must come of our own volition. That volition, that's an interesting word. It means, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, the power to make your own decisions. Merriam-Webster defines it as the power of choosing or determining. The corresponding Greek word that would be translated volition, if the translators had done that, was bulomai. And it means to will deliberately, to have a purpose, to desire. It's used in Acts 27 and verse 42. But the centurion... Wanting to save Paul, that's that Greek word, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who should swim should jump overboard and first get to land. It's used in Mark 15 and verse 15. So Pilate, wanting, again there's that word, to gratify the crowd, release Barabbas to them, he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Jesus wants us to commit ourselves because that's what we've decided to do that we have reached that decision, that we sign our own declaration of independence, that we sign our own declaration of dependence. Without hesitation, without hot thought of what may come, that's what I've decided to do. Just as an Old Testament slave could freely walk away, you and I always had that same option. But the slave committed, according to the Exodus, not because they had to, but because they loved their master and they couldn't imagine life anywhere else. And I hope and pray that that, as you look at Jesus, is how you feel about him. You can't imagine being anywhere else. Thomas Jefferson said of the Declaration, And for the support of this Declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Are you willing to pledge your life to Jesus this morning? John Morton, who also signed the declaration on his deathbed only eight months after he signed it, said, that event was to be the most glorious service I have ever rendered to my country. But not near as glorious as declaring your dependence on Jesus and your independence from sin. 
How much more will we appreciate our declaration of independence, our declaration of dependence, when we hear those wonderful words, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter in to the joy of your Lord. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Is there a declaration of independence and dependence you need to make this morning? If do, we hope you'll do it with a free and open heart. That you do it convinced that this is what you must and should do. And if we can help you in any way, we'd love to have that opportunity. Make this a day you celebrate, not because it's the 4th of July, but because it's the day that your sins were washed away and you became a child of God. And if we can help you in any way in that process, one of our elders will be down front. All you have to do is step out of the aisle, and you can do that now as together we stand and sing. For your sins be they shall be as white as snow. Lord, your sins be as One more song and then we'll have a prayer and some announcements. Three verses of How Sweet, How Heavenly. How sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's easy life and so be some announcements following the, the closing prayer. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we give thanks to you, our God, the God that knows us, each and every one of us, knows all about us, and cares, cares for us every day. Father, we give thanks to you because you have sent your Son and make, to make us free, make us free from the sins that that separated us from you and reconciled us that you may be our father and we may be your children. Father, we pray that 
as we go on to this week that you would be with us. Help us to depend on you, Father. Help us to lean on you for those, those times when we are weak. Father, we, we pray that, that we would always look to your word, look to your will for, the, for how we should treat each other, how we should act. Father, we pray that you would be with all of us as we uh, search to serve you, ser serve each other uh, in accordance with your will. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good afternoon. And summer is back in Colorado Springs, isn't it? After a week, week and a half of pretty good weather, milder temperatures, cooler weather, we're back in the fryer again. But it's July, and we, of course, expect that. We have just these few announcements that we'll pass along once again. Our heartfelt sympathies to the family of Kendra Hollis. Last Sunday, her sister Paige died suddenly. It was unexpected. That's a blow, and the family is dealing with that grief. And we lift them up in our prayers and remember them during this time of trial. Also want to remember our friend Mona Bowers. Mona has been diagnosed with COPD, and some days are pretty good, and some days are pretty miserable. This comes on top of everything else that's on Mona's plate, so we're mindful of that, and we want to remember her in our prayers as well, John Ryan, Pam, as they continue the treatment for the cancer as they're up in Denver. Penny Sinclair as she recovers at home from her foot and ankle surgery. Jackie Davenport is recovering from a fall and we're hoping and praying that she's on the mend and back on her feet soon. This afternoon, five o'clock, Kevin's YouTube class on the Book of Romans. This Wednesday evening in our building at 6.30, Bible classes. And then once again next Sunday, we hope that you'll join us. And may the Lord bless and keep us all.